Welcome back to Science Click. Today, the symmetries of the universe. There are many complex laws that seemingly govern our universe. Conservation of energy, of momentum, general relativity, the standard model of particles. Yet all this complexity emerges from a deeper, purer concept, of which all these laws are only consequences. Symmetry. In mathematics, a symmetry is a transformation which leaves an object unchanged. A sphere, for example, has a rotational symmetry. You can turn it around, change its orientation, and it remains the same. An infinite rope is symmetric by translation. We can move along the rope, it remains the same. It turns out that the universe can also have symmetries. A symmetry of the universe is a transformation that does not affect the laws of physics. To understand, imagine an empty universe in which we carry out a simple experiment. We throw a ball. Once released, it continues to move in a straight line at a constant speed. Now, imagine that we travel through the universe and carry out the same experiment but somewhere else. Here too, we observe that the ball continues in a straight line at a constant speed. It behaves in the same way. The laws of physics have not changed from one place to the other. This universe obeys a translational symmetry. We can move through the universe, perform our experiment in another place. The result is always the same. This empty universe also obeys a symmetry under rotations. We could have turned, changed orientation, the result would have been the same. Finally, this universe is also symmetric through time. We could have waited and thrown the ball a little later. The laws of physics do not change from one instant to the next. The fact that the universe obeys symmetries, that the laws of physics remain the same under certain transformations, imposes restrictions on the behaviour of objects. To understand, let's go back to our empty universe and throw the ball. Once thrown, the ball acquires a forward motion, and at the next instant it is slightly further ahead, it has moved. But if we assume that the universe is symmetric under translation, that the laws of physics remain the same when we change position, then the situation is equivalent to the previous instant. The ball is moved, but the laws of physics remain the same there, and at every instant the ball therefore evolves in the same way. If the laws of the universe are invariant by translation, symmetry forces the ball to conserve its motion, which explains why it traces a straight line at a constant speed. Similarly, if an object rotates on itself, assuming that the laws of physics are invariant under rotations, at the next instant the situation is equivalent, and the symmetry will therefore force the object to conserve its rotation. Thus, to be respected, each symmetry of the universe imposes the conservation of a quantity, conservation of momentum for translations, angular momentum for rotations, and energy for symmetry through time. This principle is called Noether's theorem. Each symmetry of the universe imposes the conservation of a certain quantity over time. Noether's theorem also applies to the content of the universe, and in particular the quantum fields that make up matter itself. A quantum field can also present symmetries. The field of electrons, for example, is made up of complex numbers, and the laws of physics that describe electrons do not change if we alter the phase of all these complex numbers. To understand, imagine that we measure the altitude of an airplane on Earth. To express the altitude of the airplane, we must fix a reference level, for example the sea level. By fixing this reference, we can describe the altitude by a number. But this choice of reference is arbitrary, 
We could have chosen another level, we would have measured different values, but the physical situation has not changed. The same situation can be described differently depending on the reference level we choose. In the same way, for the electron field, we can change the reference level, which corresponds to altering the phase of all complex numbers, without this affecting the physical situation which is described. This change of reference constitutes a symmetry, and according to Noether's theorem, this symmetry also imposes the conservation of a quantity, the electric charge. Conservation laws, such as the conservation of energy or electric charge, are therefore not fundamental. In general, these quantities are not necessarily conserved. It is only when the universe presents an underlying symmetry that, in order to be respected, the symmetry imposes the conservation of a quantity. The principle of equal and opposite reaction, for example, which boils down to the conservation of momentum when two objects separate, is only a consequence of symmetry under translation. If one object goes one way, the other must go the other way. Thanks to this symmetry, rockets can take off upwards by ejecting material downwards. However, a problem arises. Unlike the simplified example of an empty universe, our real universe does not appear to be fully symmetric. At a time scale of billions of years, for example, the universe expands and it is therefore not perfectly symmetric over time. As a result, on a large scale, the energy of the universe is not conserved. Light, for example, gradually loses energy, its wavelength gets stretched as the universe expands. The universe is not perfectly symmetric under translations either. It contains stars and planets and is therefore not the same everywhere at this scale. Thus, if we throw an object, in general its momentum is not conserved. On Earth, for example, an apple falls downwards, it accelerates. Its movement changes over time because the situation is not symmetric. At first glance, our universe does not seem to respect symmetries. Even worse, the laws of physics appear to be different depending on the frame from which we observe. If we drop a ball inside a centrifuge, from the outside the ball seems to conserve its movement. But from the inside, the movement of the ball is not conserved, it accelerates towards the surface. How can we explain that the ball behaves differently? The laws of physics are absolute. If we want a good description of our universe, we would like all objects, whatever our point of view, to always obey the same laws. When changing point of view, the laws of the universe should not change, they must remain the same for everyone. Yet the behaviour of the ball is not the same. To solve this problem, to restore the invariance of the laws of physics, for the ball to be described by the same laws from both points of view, it will be necessary to add a new element to our description. To understand, let's go back to the previous analogy. We measure the altitude of an airplane. The plane is moving straight ahead, and if we take the sea level as a reference, we measure a constant altitude. It draws a straight line. That said, let's imagine that we took the surface of the Earth as a reference. This time, because of the mountains, we measure an altitude that varies over time, as if the plane was moving in zigzags. Taking the surface as a reference, the behaviour of the airplane now seems different. But the situation has not changed, the plane is moving straight ahead. How can we explain that, while it faces straight ahead, its altitude varies over time? To solve this paradox, it is necessary to introduce some kind of force field that would push the airplane up or down, depending on the reference level that we've chosen, thus explaining its behaviour. When going from one reference level to another, from sea level to land level, it is necessary to add this force field to properly account for the behaviour of the aircraft. 
Going back to the example of the ball in the centrifuge, the situation is exactly the same. Moving from one point of view to the other, from outside to inside the centrifuge, the ball seems to obey different laws, and it is necessary to add some kind of force field to our description. This is what we call inertial forces, and in particular, the centrifugal and Coriolis forces. By adding these inertial forces, we reinstate the laws of physics as absolute. The behaviour of the ball can now be understood very well in any frame of reference, as long as we add this force field, which depends on which point of view we choose. Introducing this kind of force field is also what gives rise to the concept of space-time curvature, and to the theory of general relativity. General relativity is a very powerful theory precisely because it restores the absoluteness of the laws of physics. By adding a new underlying structure, the curvature of space-time, general relativity makes it possible to describe the universe from any point of view using the same equations. Surprisingly enough, this reasoning, adding a field to restore the invariance of the laws of physics, is also the basis for all fundamental interactions in particle physics. We have seen that the quantum field of electrons has a symmetry. The laws which describe it are invariant when we shift the phase of all complex numbers globally. But if we alter the phase differently in different parts of the field locally, which amounts to choosing a reference level in zigzags like the surface of the Earth, the laws which describe electrons seem to have changed. In other words, this change of reference is not a symmetry. If we want to re-establish the laws of physics as absolute, for this to be a symmetry, whatever reference level we choose, we need to change our description. We must introduce another underlying structure, a kind of force field with which the electron field interacts to account for this change in behaviour. This other structure is called the electromagnetic field. It contains particles that interact with electrons, photons. In a way, if two objects repel each other due to their electric charge, if we do not fall through our chair when we sit, and if light exists in the universe, it is thanks to this local symmetry being able to choose any reference level for complex numbers, which requires the existence of a new field and new particles, the photons, with which the electrons interact. To conclude, studying the symmetries of the universe allows us to understand in a deep way the origin of the laws which govern it. It is because the universe has symmetries that the objects it contains, in order to respect these symmetries, obey physical laws. Be it conservation of energy or momentum, objects obey these laws only to respect underlying symmetries, intrinsic to the universe. By considering that the laws of physics must be absolute, that changing our point of view or level of reference must constitute a symmetry that does not affect the physical reality, we call this a gauge symmetry. We deduce the presence of new structures in the universe, like the curvature of space-time or the electromagnetic field. Experimentally, symmetries also allow us to unveil the hidden mysteries of matter. By measuring certain properties of particles, and by studying the geometric diagrams that we obtain, symmetries have allowed scientists to understand, for instance, that protons, neutrons and other baryons are formed of three smaller objects, which obey a fundamental symmetry based on the number three, quarks. There are also discrete symmetries. For example, inverting the charge, direction through space as well as direction through time of all particles constitutes a symmetry. An antiparticle can in this way be interpreted as an ordinary particle that moves backwards through time. Finally, some speculative modern theories postulate that the universe could have an even deeper symmetry, a symmetry between particles of matter and particles of interaction, as if both obeyed the same laws. This is what we call 
supersymmetry.